Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I can tell you're really successful, but I don't know if you're saying it. That's what it works Good afternoon. I think we're going to get started. Um, I'm Marsha Lynn. Um, welcome. I'm so glad to see you all here for the um, Monday afternoon uh, colloquium. It's sponsored by a variety of groups, including Sesame and CD and other um, aspects of the School of Education. And we're very fortunate today um, to have Sven Stromquist. I've been working on this, but I'm not <laughs> quite right. Um, as our speaker, uh, he and I have known each other for quite a while. I am originally, we originally met when I was the, uh, one of the um, advisors for a Wallenberg grant on technology and education that was joint between Sweden and Stanford University. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of, for one of the meetings, uh, going to Lund University, where Sven was the um, vice president for research, and getting a grand tour of the really beautiful campus. I sent him off to look at the Berkeley campus today, but I'm afraid that the comparison um, is not a good one. But at least they're different. <laughs> um, we had a very interesting time thinking about how technology can uh, be used to improve education in this uh, in this grant uh, direction. And I think that uh, the it was kind of early in the time when people were really thinking about, especially how to incorporate technology into higher education and. The Wallenberg Foundation was, um, with I think a lot of advice from Sven, very effective in thinking about how to make small changes in courses that would allow you to gain some insight into what works and what doesn't work. Subsequently, um, Sven was involved in another project with Wallenberg to really think more deeply about online learning, and I attended one of their meetings last year, about a year ago. Um, and it was very fascinating to, I think, also to bring together all the different cultural perspectives on that topic. Um, Sven has continued to really, I think, be um, good at looking at uh, issues in education from all different cultural perspectives. Uh, he's recently been thinking hard about revision processes. When do we revise? Why do we revise? How do we learn how to revise? And um, you know, when are those revisions productive and effective? So we're lucky today to have him talk a little bit about that work. Um, and I think you'll find it very inspiring and also help you to think about your own revision processes. Uh, this is a topic that is uh, relevant to my work as well. So if you come up with any great ideas, let me know. Anyway, welcome. We're so happy Thank to you. have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marsha, for the introduction. And thanks for coming here today. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, the revision process is partly uh, unexplored territory for me, but uh, uh, I am now moving into uh, a phase of my research where I would like to explore uh, the revision process and to try to create a broader framework where projects from different angles of, of academia might uh, fit in. So let me tell you a little bit about my background and my research interests and then move into this more new and unexplored territory. Also let me uh, thank those of you who, with whom I got an opportunity to, to discuss revision today uh, around lunchtime. The most inspiring uh, discussion and uh, uh, you're doing very interesting work, I think. So, in, in the uh, 1980s and early 90s, I, I was deep, deep into Chai language and, and uh, language acquisition. Uh, my group produced the first machine-readable longitudinal case study corpus in Scandinavia, and we profited a lot from, from that corpus, around half a million running words from five Swedish children from around 18 to 48 months of age. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, in the uh, early 90s and, and uh, 
still to some extent, uh, uh, I moved more into the development of spoken and written language during the school age. I and my group ha have also done uh, studies of reading and writing in functionally impaired groups, dyslexics, congenitally blind, uh, tactile readers, and we've developed some technologies for studying that too. Another type of background which I'm getting more and more into is the broad notion of cognitive consequences of linguistic diversity. And this has much been inspired and in cooperation with a professor here at the neighboring building of psychology, Dan Slobin, and, and many of his associates. I had the privilege of working closely together with him since the early 90s on, on these issues. So what do we mean by that? Well. Uh, Different linguistic corners of the world seem to make partly different habitual or preferential choices on which information to encode when they talk about a certain event. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so uh, maybe that we are thinking about uh, these things in, in partly different ways when we are, when we have decided to encode uh, our ideas about the motion scenario, for example, into a linguistic form. There are also cognitive consequences in the sense of how you organize your attention and what you remember. I, I will get back to that. Um, Dan Slobin is, is the visionary guy behind this. Uh, I added com comparisons of spoken and written language to our joint work. Uh, so Dan's slogan here is that thinking for speaking is a little bit different between different languages. Thinking for writing is certainly different from thinking for speaking in any given linguistic community, I would say. <laughs> I've also had the privilege of uh, helping create a lab environment at Lund University, the so-called Lund University Humanities Lab. You can visit the site here, umlab.lu.se. It is basically a uh, cognitive neuroscience lab designed specifically to tease, <laughs> uh, encourage uh, students and uh, researchers in the humanities and social sciences to take their research question to a more empirical level, uh, designing experiments and carrying them out, uh, often real-time uh, experiments. So we have a wonderful facility now with uh, an anechoic chamber various uh, uh, technologies for uh, mapping uh, re be be online behavior, uh, eye tracking, uh, electrophysiological uh, uh, equipment, and uh, motion capture equipment, and, and so on. Uh, well, uh, I was made um, vice president of research at Lund University. I recruited a, a, a new director to the lab. Uh, her name is Marianne Gullberg. Some of you might know her. She's doing an absolutely brilliant job in, in uh, forwarding the lab. Uh, another interest uh, of mine, as Marsha hinted at, uh, has to do with uh, information technology <coughs> and uh, I was one of three uh, principal investigators in a European project called ECHO, <laughs> European Cultural Heritage Online, which is of course a massive enterprise. Uh, we did a very ambitious pilot phase in, uh, two in the early 2000s, um, setting up uh, a uh, uh, distributed website with four different uh, areas of investigation, um, uh, languages, uh, history of arts, uh, history of ideas, and uh, um, uh, lexicon. And, um, The idea was not only to make uh, digitized resources available uh, 
across the world, but also to uh, furnish researchers and students with common uh, tools for exploring the material and uh, making annotations uh, online uh, during discussions which could have participants from any corner of the world. I've also designed a, uh, uh, an early version of a uh, computer tool which makes uh, use of the logging function of the computer so that uh, you can uh, um, log and analyze uh, writing behavior on a keyboard. Uh, it's called Scriptlog and uh, the first version of Scriptlog was launched in 96 and now there are refined versions uh, in many places and uh, it's, it's uh, simply designed for researchers to get a grasp of virtually all the aspects you don't get a handle on uh, when you look at the finally edited text. The temporal patterning of the writing from micro events to discourse level events and uh, uh, corrections and revisions. So that's probably where I got more heavily interested in, in revision processes during text writing online. And th <coughs> this, of course, was a, an important uh, precondition to our contrasted studies of speech and writing. Let me say a few things about uh, uh, the content of our research. Here is a wordless uh, picture story uh, by an American artist, Mercer Meyer, uh, which we used in uh, Dan Slobin's great coordinated uh, project on, on how events are related in different linguistic corners of the world. It's a 24 picture uh, booklet, and uh, here is a little series of events. Uh, the uh, picture story in its entirety depicts a boy who has uh, uh, caught a frog and one night the frog escapes from the boy's room and he goes out in the woods together with his dog to uh, look for the frog and uh, there are lots of motion events uh, <laughs> in this story and let's look at one of them. Uh, in a rather common uh, way of analyzing locomotion. We could talk about the source of the motion event, path, and the goal. Here are some examples of how five-year-olds from uh, a few different languages, altogether we had 72 different languages in this study. <clears throat> Here are just uh, a few of them. So a Russian five-year-old said, I spal vodu. And uh, to uh, an educated ear, spal means slept. But this guy is actually focusing on pal, which means fell. And s is a prefix which uh, encodes downward mo motion. So it's not speech, but pa past. <laughs> anyway, uh, and fell into the water uh, is the uh, close translation into English. In French, il tombait de la précipice, uh, they, they <laughs> fell from the cliff. So here, uh, the focus or the encoded information is on the goal. Here it is on the uh, source. Icelandic, and so that hundrin och strävkrin och vanlig show. This is an interesting language. It has so complex uh, semantics in its uh, preposition of the system <laughs> from above down into <laughs> so it really encodes a lot of what is going on over there and here's a typical Spanish five-year-old or it's a typical adult actually but there are not so big differences between five-year-olds and adults interestingly in this case but anyway los tiro un precipicio donde había agua entonces se cayó so there is no explicit encoding of direction uh, uh, here. It is sort of uh, uh, 
to be inferred, <laughs> if you like. He dragged them to a cliff where there was a lot of water, and then they fell. Okay. But you know, these examples, needless to say, are not uh, 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 untypical. Here's a, uh, what's it called? Uh, multi-dimensional modeling of uh, the uh, explicit encoding of sp spatial information and direction. <laughs> and uh, it's visualized by a, a very clever uh, student of mine. Uh, and uh, uh, Every dot here uh, represents at least 10, at the topmost 30, um, storytellers in three different age groups. <laughs> you can't see this, but X is five-year-olds, Y is nine-year-olds, and Z are adults from different languages. So here are the three Swedish samples. And these are averages. Uh, course. Uh, so Swedish five-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and adults. Uh, German, Dutch, Icelandic, Polish, Russian, Turkish, Hebrew, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and French. So as you know, uh, as many of you know, uh, traditional uh, linguistic typology of the languages of the world make kind of romantic assumption and say, you know, you, you, you express approximately the same things in all languages of the world, or you can express approximately the same things in all languages of the world. But this information is packaged in very different forms. And then you classify the languages of the world according to those forms. So we didn't do that. We are classifying the languages here, or rather we are placing them in this multidimensional space according to the content expressed. And the outcome is very similar to traditional language typology. Up here you can see the Romance languages, here are the Slavic languages, here are the uh, um, Semitic languages, and here's a subgroup of the German languages uh, with Scandinavian. And this was, I wouldn't say a revelation to me, but I was very pleasantly surprised and encouraged by, by this finding, so to speak. So if you consult grammar books and uh, multilingual lexica, you will find that uh, in French you can absolutely say uh, elle traverse la rue en allant, or a pied, and giving information about manner of motion. It's just that from modern spoken habits. <laughs> you don't do that in French. You just say, a traverse la rue, a croise la rue, or something like that. So here we pick up, you know, the habits of speakers in different age groups without a bias, the built-in bias you get if you, do, if you base your uh, typology on translation studies. The old studies were mostly made on the basis of translations of the Bible. So if you translate uh, an Eng English version of the Bible into whatever, uh, Turkish, that's an unlikely a bad example, but anyway, the, the Turkish text will be a little bit more English than an unbiased Turkish text. And we try to circumvent this methodological fallacy, if you like, exactly by using a wordless picture booklet. Okay. So, uh, after having built the lab, <laughs> we could start uh, doing experiments. So here's uh, an experiment done by one of my doctoral students, uh, Richard Anderson. Uh, uh, and uh, the way he did it was to, to uh, make use of eye tracking equipment and he presented um, 
some still pictures depicting motion events or small video clips uh, to a panel uh, or to subjects and uh, some got to hear his limping across the floor maybe or his across the room or his leaving the room and he found that the verb with more information about manner of motion attracted more uh, dwelling time of, of, of the listener's eyes on the relevant part of the body where you know the manner of motion was to be interpreted. They were looking more at the leg region uh, in, in this case. <coughs> and when he uh, administered a recall task half a half an hour later uh, with uh, you know, tricky question like incidentally do you remember if she was wearing boots or sandals those who uh, got to hear the verb with more information about manner of motion they could answer the question correctly so this little sort of idyllic experiment was also very encouraging it taught us that wow these subtle differences have cognitive consequences in the sense of how you organize your visual attention and what you remember. Here's another, here's an example from, from another area of, of previous research. Uh, this is uh, the uh, <laughs> score of script log, or one, one of the scores of an early version of script log. So uh, this is time running. We, are, we start here 50.20 seconds into the writing activity. The event over there in the uh, rightmost column is space. <laughs> and then 30 uh, point, point, point 0.3 seconds later, uh, the writer writes an M and so on and so forth. So vertically here you can, write, you can see that he writes M I F O. You have to take away the F and write the G instead. So a little uh, simple typo, which was discovered then. From these kind of uh, recordings or representations, we can derive all sorts of things. Here are uh, discourse level uh, profiles uh, from 9 to 12 year olds, 15 year olds, and adults writing the frog story. Uh, and you see here the distribution of the upper upper uh, uh, series of dots represent uh, the total amount of keystrokes and the lower one uh, the amount of edited as it were keystrokes that is five uh, keystrokes remaining or letters <coughs> remaining in the finally edited text so you can move in and look closer at exactly what was corrected or revised and so on. By and large you can see that uh, the youngest age group spend a lot of effort in the beginning and then they get worn out uh, pretty fast. The 15 year olds manage to keep a more economic distribution of their writing efforts but only the adults make uh, a lot of variations according to the demands of the different uh, events and episodes of the story. And when you look closer at the difference between uh, uh, the uh, total number of keystrokes and, and uh, edited ones, you can see that uh, when you look behind that, uh, uh, you, you, you discover that they are making, only the adults are making much more content uh, revisions. Uh, than the other age groups. The youngest ones are almost exclusively concerned with spelling mistakes. You can derive uh, little curves like this. Uh, if uh, here's a 30-minute writing activity, personal narrative um, by a 15-year-old. If there had been no revisions or corrections whatsoever 
it would have been a perfectly straight line here. But any slope means going back in the text to a previous position, if you like. And uh, if, you're, if, if, if it is a uh, down, downhill slope, it means deleting text. And if it's an uphill slope, it means adding text. So here you can see at the very, towards the very end, this writer is going back to the middle of the text and is adding material there. And of course you can go behind this and, and, uh, and look at, at the real content of the revisions. So you can, you can, you can automatically derive profiles like that. In a dissertation by Osa Wengelin, a former doctoral student of mine and now a professor in Gothenburg, she used this too to look at writing activity in dyslexic adults uh, and uh, also in, in the younger age groups. And <coughs> this is a perfectly opaque notation to the, to the uh, uh, non-expert eye. But anyway, all these little guys here represent different types of contexts of, of writing. So this, for example, is... is uh, the transition between a space and the first letter of the next word. Uh, this is the transition between a full stop and a space after the full stop, and so on and so forth. And here we look at the distribution of uh, pausing behavior in these different contexts in control screen and dyslexics uh, blue. These are adults. And you can see that it's a very similar distribution. It's magnified in the dyslexics. They do more pausing uh, than, than the uh, controls. But there is one very interesting structural uh, dissimilarity. Pausing within a word is so much more frequent, both in absolute and relative terms, in the dyslexics and in the controls, so that this measure is actually a rather reliable, automatically derived uh, diagnostic indicator. Another such indicator is if you try to rewrite the same word form, oh, the same word more than twice, the chance is pretty big that you have really big uh, reading and writing problems. So that's what uh, uh, Osa Wengelin did in her dissertation. Let's go back to this old script of score and look a little bit at exactly this, uh, what, what, what's, hap what's happening here. We were originally, and we still are, very interested in discourse level patterning of writing. But you can use this tool also to look at the more microscopic <laughs> context, individual word writing, for example. So here, matteprov, that's Swedish for math exam. So it's a lexical compound. Uh, it's written as one word without space in Swedish. And here you can see that there is one transition between two adjacent letters, which is much longer than the other transitions. And that very transition coincides with the boundary between the two uh, um, parts of the lexical compound. Uh, <coughs> so, we, we, we go <laughs> by inspecting <coughs> uh, protocols like this, <coughs> We, uh, we got interested in, in the microscopic <laughs> structure of writing. And uh, this um, is perhaps the most important uh, outcome of, of that sort of observation. It's, uh, um, it's a um, publication from April uh, this year. And uh, here we did something in cooperation with colleagues in Finland. Uh, the main author of this uh, article is Raymond Gartron, a French guy who is uh, now uh, 
almost the Finnish guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what he did was to use a, a script log um, a, um, option where you can uh, distribute uh, uh, stimuli and uh, uh, look at uh, the time structure from stimulus onset to response onset. They, the subjects were here asked to write down the, the uh, compound. So uh, individual word writing, tennis racket of course, uh, fire engine, you know, things like that. And here we could show, uh, in, in a much more precise way, what the fine-grained structure of individual word writing, in this case, exactly in lexical compounds, look like. Uh, it's a good idea to use Finnish here. Uh, Finnish is richer than Swedish in compounding. and. Uh, uh, so it, it's an unusually, uh, there are an unusual lot of, of, of compound words in, in Finnish from a typological point of view. Anyway, so these guys are used to writing compounds. Anyway, what we found was that the transition time between stimulus onset and response onset, how fast the subject started writing, was very, very fast. And this uh, speed persisted throughout the first syllable, but then it slowed down. And the following structure was very much determined by the linguistic structure, the information structure of the compound word. So again, a far greater transition time uh, coinciding with the uh, boundaries between the two uh, component parts of the compound. Uh, greater uh, trans transition time times uh, in morpheme level, in morpheme boundaries, in syllable boundaries. If you control, so to speak, for these types of inf information boundaries, uh, a rather good predictor of speed of writing was the frequency of the collocations as assessed from a big uh, uh, frequency dictionary. So, uh, you seem to uh, find the word fast in memory. Uh, you seem to have planned the first syllable in advance, but then you need some extra little, little extra planning for doing this and that. Uh, even at writing a simple word like uh, tennis racket. So, um, if you take your point of departure in, in certain theoretical models and assumptions and previous research, you can say some beautiful things <laughs> about this. <laughs> but you know, it, it really teaches us that not only on the discourse level is there a, uh, uh, highly structured uh, temporal patterning to the writing, but on this micro level as well. And we've done similar studies with pe paper and pencil using our, uh, uh, using our uh, body tracking equipment. So you can, you can look at that kind of writing as composed of upstrokes and downstrokes, right? And in, in uh, beginner writers, you can see how terribly slow and uh, uh, these upstrokes and downstrokes are. In uh, versatile writers, you can see that it, they have a ballistic structure, so you speed up to get at the goal at the top, and then you slow down, and then you speed up again. But these downstrokes and upstrokes in versatile writers, they are also subject to exactly the same constraints in terms. So they slow down a little bit more when there is a syllable boundary or, or a morphing boundary and so on. So very, and there's a lot of structure to this microscopic behavior. Yeah? 
Uh, a clarification question. Uh, you mentioned languages that have uh, different orthographic systems. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you, you know, you found no effect of different, you know, mapping the uh, sound of letter mapping, mm. and and uh, because you know those traditional um, theories that you mentioned mm. do um, consider and bring up the issue yeah. of. Uh, yeah. uh, Yes, I, yeah, I, I think it, it would be wonderful to move into uh, really different types of writing systems like Chinese, uh, not pin, Pinyin, but the old one, uh, and, and, and so on. That, that, that would be great. We haven't done that. But we have looked at Hebrew, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether you're writing from right to left to left to right. Mm -hmm. uh, then the, there are these differences between the uh, weight of, of the consonants and, and vowels and so on in the writing systems. But uh, by and large, we, we could see similar things. I, I have a colleague at uh, Ramat Aviv University in Tel Aviv, uh, um, Ruth Berman and her group, they have used script talk and found a little bit similar things. But the for, for the research on, on other writing systems, it is, is most, uh, would be most interesting to conduct. Let me share one more uh, thing with you here. Uh, we were careful in our studies in Sweden to uh, vary the order of the writing and the speaking condition for the frog stories and for other uh, type of studies we have done with personal narratives and expository texts and so on. And this, you can think of this as, as a way of, of looking at the impact of speaking on writing or writing on speaking. And here is a little peek at the study by another doctoral student of mine from Portugal, Rui Alves. Uh, so, uh, uh, what he found was that, well, he, the, <coughs> the um, um, independent variable here uh, would be the order of the speaking and writing condition. The dependent variable he chose was uh, vocabulary diversity. How diverse is your vocabulary when you give your narrative in the spoken condition and when you give it in the written condition. So as you can see here, uh, the highest diversity of vocabulary was displayed in the writing condition when you started writing. And the most meager, if you like, or less, least diverse vocabulary was displayed in the spoken condition when you start speaking. But now, the second uh, highest vocabulary diversity was found when you were speaking contingent upon having written. So there are some kind of memory traces, or whatever you want to call it, from the previous condition to the uh, subsequent condition. And also writing, vocabulary diversity of writing was much lower here as compared to here, uh, as compared to here, when uh, contingent on the spoken condition. And you can see that all these differences are uh, significant. A lot of these uh, findings were uh, <laughs> summed up in uh, this beautiful table. <laughs> in this it's beautiful to book. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, the results. I'll pause. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave uh, the uh, PowerPoint presentation with Marsha. Uh, and laid down in a book uh, which came out on uh, Erlbaum in 2004, Relating Events in Narrative. Uh, five years later, I uh, published a book in Swedish. So far, it has not been translated. Uh, and it's called Språkets Öga, The Eye of Language, on the Paths Between uh, Thoughts and Words, is the subtitle. And here are a few uh, main ideas or red threads from that book. 
when we are building an utterance or a text, we are building a model of our thoughts on the conditions of the language and the medium in question. And this model can really be reworked over and over again. So it's a, it's a, a an empirical question how you determine that enough is enough. Now, now, uh, now, the uh, rebuilding or revision uh, process should terminate. And again, uh, these conditions differ between different languages of the world. Uh, it's different for speech and writing. Uh, the differences have consequences for which information will be expressed, uh, not totally and utterly, but in, in enough detail to, to map out <laughs> uh, typological differences between the languages of the world. Consequences for how we organize our, atten our attention and when we are using the language and medium in question and consequences for what we remember. So that's where I am today, if you like. And now I'm eager to continue doing research. And I'm beginning to think that it would be very interesting to study the revision process in a broad sense uh, with these different uh, uh, sort of research interests. Uh, and I surely would like to look more into revision processes in our uh, rich linguistic data sets <coughs> in my lab. But I would like to broaden the perspectives considerably, uh, at least in, in a long term uh, perspective here, to literary text, I mean text written by novelists or poets and, and so on, to maybe formal languages, how are mathematical proofs arrived at and how are they revised and when, uh, when, uh, when does a math mathematician, a constructor of a mathematical proof decide that I'm, now I'm ready. <laughs> I'm not going to do this, do any more reworking here. Art, photography, painting, sculpture, uh, uh, music, architecture, maybe other areas. And focusing on, on the revision process as a, an empirical window on, on the paths between thoughts and external representations and asking the question, how are you building and rebuilding your model? Um, I'm not at all sure that revising or revision is a well-defined term or concept. So I'm just putting it in the context here of uh, more and less uh, closely associated uh, uh, terms or meanings. Um, just to give you a little idea of how, how we might want to uh, uh, delimit the, the meaning of revision here. So, in psycholinguistics, which is my branch uh, of studies, uh, studies of repairs and corrections have been fairly frequent and uh, uh, well well done, I would say, over the past uh, few decades. Self-repairs, one of the most uh, cited papers in, in uh, linguistics and closely associated areas is a paper by uh, a troika of um, Californian ethnomethodologists, uh, Sachs, Harvey Sachs, Emmanuel Shegloff and Gail Jefferson from the late 70s called the, or the, these titles are so elaborate, um, it's called something like uh, the preference for self repairs in the organization of the, for conversation, <laughs> I didn't even remember the title. Anyway, it's a very interesting paper and it's about self repairs in casual spoken conversations. The timing of the repairs, 
and how it relates to turn taking and so on. Uh, but repairing and correcting, uh, semantically speaking, presupposes that there is an error or a deficiency, an error to be corrected or a deficiency to be repaired. And this is not really what I am so interested in. I'm more interested in revising and reworking to the extent that that implies new ideas. So a more substantial type of revision. What about the other guys here? Well, uh, repeating and practicing and rehearsing uh, does not necessarily imply skills, but I would say it's typically. Whereas discovering, reinterpreting, reorienting would have more to do with knowledge and ideas uh, of some kind. And there is some sort of uh, interaction between uh, revising, reworking, discovering, reinterpreting, reorienting, and developing and learning, which is uh, interesting and, and deserves to be worked out a little bit more. I wonder, for example, if practices of revision and reworking can be learned so that they facilitate reinterpretation or learning of different kinds, or if revising and reworking is uh, unidirectionally uh, contingent on reinterpretations and uh, learning, new, new learning experiences. I would like to think that there is some interaction there. So, I showed you this simple automatically derived graph of a revision uh, uh, activity. This <laughs> is an other trace of the revision activity which is far more complicated and uh, suggests that the simple graph, however uh, easily arrived at, might seriously underdetermine what is go can be going on when, when uh, a professional writer is engaging in heavy revision. Anyone, have, has anyone of you seen this uh, uh, manuscript before? It's by Balzac. And uh, uh, this late, uh, this, uh, this 20th century French novelist was infamous for revising his manuscripts thoroughly over and over again and demanding from his publisher that he had a new proof printed from each and every version like that. So it was driving the publisher crazy, but it also uh, testifies to the importance Balzac most probably attached to interacting with his manuscript to generate new ideas. And that's precisely the kind of thing I'm more interested in. How does the author interact with the external representation, revising it to forward uh, uh, more ideas, uh, not, not just the, uh, the process of grooming or smoothening uh, uh, with very little impact of content. So, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm a serious amateur photographer, so I try to uh, <laughs> think a little bit about on what grounds I, I uh, revise pictures. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, vantage points uh, when I do street photography. I, I'm leaning on a lamppost on the other side of the street and I take pictures for an hour maybe or so of, of uh, pedestrians on the other side <laughs> of the crossing. And uh, when these three uh, women uh, appeared, I thought, wow, they were not the group, they just formed a, 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 a casual group when, when they stood there at the crossing. When I looked at this photograph afterwards, uh, a few days afterwards, I decided I wanted to crop the picture uh, very much. So th this, is, this is, of course, one of the things you do as a photographer to, to uh, focus on, on certain things. And then I got the opportunity to 
make an exhibition the other year. So I paired uh, this photograph with that on the left hand and that on the right hand, and I changed a little bit the colors in order for this triplet to be beautiful. So these are the kind of, of, of uh, things you can do as a photographer, and they are so very, very different from how you revise a text, of course, where you need the proposition of content, cohesion of content, and, and so on. So this has made me interested in, in at least trying to study revision process across very different domains and media and modalities, if you like. So I, earlier this year, I've given similar seminars to this one uh, at Lund University to the School of Architecture, the School of Fine and Performing Arts, the School of Music, the School of uh, uh, department, the mathematics department, and we also have a lovely museum of sketches. Have you been there, Marsha? Yeah. It's basically a museum uh, collecting snapshots from uh, sculptures uh, and um, uh, producers of uh, public art. Snapshots on models towards the uh, uh, eventual final uh, piece of art. <clears throat> so I've talked to all of them, I've given seminars there, and they all say, wow, the revision process is so important to the production of uh, final architectural drawing, a piece of art, uh, uh, a consistent mathematical proof, and so on. Um, but uh, we don't know of any scientific studies of this process. I know of some studies, uh, so I'm not at all claiming that there are none, but uh, this is a, I, I think it's fair to say this is an underexplored and under-researched uh, domain or, or uh, activity. There are occasional essays, for example by Igor Stravinsky, he wrote a little essay in the late 1940s on how essential it is for a professional composer to uh, uh, revise. Uh, and this squares well with some outlier, outlier data uh, we already have. For example, we, we hired <laughs> a professional author of children's books, a Swedish author, to write the frog story. And this is a record-breaking uh, um, uh, performance in content revision. She rewrote the whole beginning of the story after having finali uh, finalized the, or, or decided on how it should end and so on. So I, I'm it's barely more than anecdotal data, but anyway, uh, real pros tend to be very good at and very open to revising their uh, sketches, even when they have come a far way uh, in, in writing, for example, a, a short story or so. But you can't uh, revise at any uh, stage with respect to any type of external representation. A sculptor, for example, arrives at the point sooner or later, or eventually arrives at the point where the process is irreversible. Uh, when you work with bronze or marble or something like that. You know? And of course, uh, that's a dimension for uh, for uh, the typology of revisions, how much inertia the, the uh, modality and medium or material uh, imposes on, on uh, the revision process. About um, more or less uh, scientific uh, uh, studies of the process, uh, 
we have a type of studies which several of you are engaged in trying to evaluate how different factors influence revision and how revision in its turn influences the development of your ideas and how you solve the problem. That's absolutely great. There is also a uh, family of studies by people who are interested in uh, working memory and uh, uh, writing something down is a way to alleviate, of course, your working memory resources for thinking about slightly different things, maybe taking another perspective, refocusing on, on uh, what you're doing without risking forgetting about what you write, wrote down. You can always return to what you wrote down. So there, there, there is a bunch of studies in, in that sort of in that sort of angle to uh, writing and revision. Uh, when you uh, construct an external representation of your ideas, you have changed the uh, affordances of, of the representation. For example, or for example, obviously you can share it with others and get uh, feedback from others on, on your ideas. And that's an enormous resource, of course. This is uh, uh, a point uh, developed in, in so-called conversational analysis. In uh, literary studies, there is a uh, branch since uh, maybe 10 years back or so, which is pretty much a labor called, which you might know, called reception theory. How is a novel or a short story or a drama or a play received by the audience? Uh, so uh, that's in, in relation to conversational analysis, that's a study of a very slow process, <laughs> if you like, of communication. But anyway, that's sort of interesting. We've been into that. Uh, uh, there is a uh, cognitive scientist, a cognitive psychologist by the name of Barbara Tversky, whom some of you might know, who has done interesting work on, uh, on uh, drawings and revisions of drawings by architects. And one of her uh, one of her, of her conclusions is that they afford uh, shifting focus and reorienting, especially uh, rethinking spatial relations. Uh, that's interesting work. You might know of other work. I would be very interested in learning more about it. Uh, yes, I guess we've been into most of these things. Uh, So how much uh, inertia is, is the medium setting up when you, when you want to do revisions? That, that's, uh, that's a question you might, you could contemplate uh, doing experiments with that, for example, uh, asking uh, subjects to write the greetings uh, to a relative or a friend or so on an expensive card by email uh, or, uh, or so and see how, how, how much revisions are afforded uh, as a consequence of, of the medium. So, uh, I would be very interested in, in, in seeing uh, what, what we're trying, trying to arrive at some kind of typology for revisions from different domains and modalities. And uh, dimensions for such a typology would be uh, a possible set of distinctive affordances for, for different uh, domains. Linguistic narratives, mathematical proofs, uh, uh, architectural drawings, whatever. 
uh, and uh, the cost uh, in terms of the degree of, of effort uh, you have to put in in order to, to uh, accomplish uh, revisions. Also, criteria for terminating the revision process. Uh, my close colleague at Stanford, Herbert Clark, uh, tells me that his favorite uh, criterion is common ground, that is, when you arrive at a joint understanding with your conversational partner, you can terminate the, the, pr the process and maybe change to another topic of conversation or so. Uh, in, uh, uh, my, my friends in, in the math uh, department at Lund tells me that truth is uh, a very powerful and simple, if you like, a criterion for saying, now I'm done here. Uh, it's harder to say what the criteria is in poetry or art. I'm not saying that there are none. I hope you can arrive at that. But I think it's, it seems to be a more, a less clear and more composite uh, uh, set of criteria there. The temporal patterning of the communicative interaction. Uh, when does the message reach the recipient? What about the timing of the feedback? If you think about conversation, casual conversation, you get immediate feedback. And you react at that feedback. Wow, he didn't understand really what I was trying to say. I have to uh, go back a little bit here and, and uh, build up the uh, common ground. Um, whereas when you uh, publish a book, <laughs> uh, you haven't been maybe so much in touch with your future authors, and when the reaction comes, uh, you are not going to revise your book. It's, it's <coughs> out there. The same goes for uh, for a piece of art uh, which you display uh, in the gallery or so. Uh, so. production process before the message reaches the recipient, the timing of the feedback from the recipient or audience, the author's response or revision on the basis of the feedback, is there any at all? Um, these are some uh, uh, preliminary ideas I have for dimensions for the typology. Uh, and all these dimensions are of course relevant for how you organize the revision process planning you do in advance, especially if you eventually reach a point where the process is irreversible or at least extremely expensive. It will be extremely expensive to do anything else but a little superficial grooming of your program. Uh, another consequence might be how much theory of mind work you need to do in the absence of feedback from your uh, recipient or your audience. Have you read Plato's dialogue, Phaedrus? It's a funny dialogue. Yeah, yeah. All, the, all those dialogues are, are cast in the form that uh, Socrates is uh, approached by some disciple and asked to uh, uh, resolve a, a problem or, or a tricky question or so. And uh, in this dialogue, uh, Socrates claims uh, to his disciples that uh, writing down a thought means killing it. Written language is perfectly dead. And then he goes into some sort of uh, explication of, of what he means by that. And what he means by that is you can't ask a text a proper question and get the proper answer. And that was of course the gist of his method, this sophistic method. Uh, now, uh, Marsha and I discussed in the in the lunch pause uh, the uh, we see now an emergence an emergence of, of some first shots at uh, textbooks based on artificial intelligence. So as a reader, you can actually ask questions to the book <laughs> and get answers, and the book can, from your reading strategies, uh, suggest things to you. So. Maybe uh, 
Plato's dialogue is then no longer so valid, you know, the conclusions that are, are, are challenged by new technology, we'll see. So where would this lead us in terms of uh, empirical studies? I'm, uh, I I've started to uh, construct a questionnaire, which are, I would like to distribute <laughs> to all these different uh, representatives, or the, all these dis representatives of very different disciplines. Uh, I've sent the first version to uh, a novelist and a mathematician and got some feedback on the questions I, I have in the questionnaire. I would like to do case studies, longitudinal case studies of creative processes by which someone is writing uh, maybe a short story or uh, uh, composing a, a piece of music or, you know, following these uh, slow or rather long-term processes of, of uh, uh, creating something and, and what revisions are going on there. Could you, could you possibly see distinct stages of a similar sort across these very different uh, uh, domains? That's partly an empirical question, of course. Experiments. Yes, I touched upon a possible experiment. Uh, more ideas for experiments would be very interesting. And since I, I have a linguistic instinct, I would also simply be interested in how do representatives from these different domains or experts in, in these different domains talk about the revision process. I know quite a bit by now about how authors uh, and, and uh, writers uh, talk about the revision process and how we who study these processes uh, talk about it. But I know very little about how artists talk about their revision processes, for example, or mathematicians. So that would maybe be another angle to uh, getting further here uh, in uh, some sort of attempt at, at getting a hand, an empirical handle on similarities and differences. Okay, um, I guess that's it. And I hope we have some time for questions. I have been talking maybe too much. <laughs> and already incredibly complex um, in, in looking at uh, revision as a cognitive process primarily. I wonder um, if you uh, if you plan with, a, and it seems that you are in a sense with the case studies and also with your last question to also add a, a more sociocultural perspective and think about revision as a cultural practice. Mm -hmm. Um, so in, in that case, for example, I think uh, that uh, uh, we would probably mm, find some tensions between what uh, um, a cognitive perspective would say about uh, when a revision process ends and, uh, and what happens in the real world where a revision process doesn't end when the author is satisfied but when the deadline comes yes. or <laughs> when, uh, you know, when uh, something else very practical. Mm. So I was wondering, and the second, second consideration is if you think about um, um, the revision as a pra cultural practice, mm -hmm. um, issues of the ideology uh, come, uh, come about. That is, uh, there are certain forms of um, revisions that are very much encoded in our educational institutions. You know, uh, creative writing programs have a very kind of uh, thought through classes where students uh, share their work and revise it, mm. and it's, it's a very collective process. Uh, in other domains, the revision is perceived of as kind of altering in a, in a um, sense that uh, spoils the product. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about going back to one of your um, hobbies or, or foci of interest, photography. There is, you know, a, a, a tradition that despises uh, Photoshop mm -hmm. um, work on pictures. And I'm thinking about Jackson Pollock and mm -hmm. other artists mm -hmm. for which 
revision is inconceivable because <laughs> art yeah. is a, this very instinctive stroke. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. thoughts about um, yeah. around these yeah. things. The variation is immense, of course. Uh, but uh, one of the many things uh, which could be interesting to look at and, and which is maybe a little bit more realistic to look at is to look at internal and external pressures to, to revise, such as a deadline, for example, or if you, uh, if, you can, if you enjoy the luxury of simply playing around with your external representation, as it were, and to develop your own uh, ideas and you have a lot of time and resources to do that. So, yeah. So, um, let's see. So, in the, in the Frog story, and when you're asking people to, you know, talk about the panels, um, you see that there are certain patterns in the way that, that individuals speak and the kind of, and, and, uh, whether maybe it's passive or active tenses, or that they focus on different parts of, of the scenes. Um, but and the, the language allows for lots more variation than mm -hmm. that, right? You can say, you can talk about, uh, you can use different tenses, you can talk about different parts of the scene, mm -hmm. but it seems like there are these patterns that emerge mm -hmm. within, the, within languages. Uh, and then in the speaking for writing versus writing for speaking, you saw that if you were um, speaking and then writing, right? Um, that you didn't quite see the same language there, but the vocabulary diversity mm -hmm. as a few of those, yeah. right? But again, all of this vocabulary exists, right? That greater vocabulary that you find in the writing is there, you're just not drawing on it. Do you think that in the revision process, you would start seeing less of these kinds of patterns in the frog story? You mm -hmm. know, if, if people were able to revise their frog storytelling, mm -hmm. What, do you think that you would end up seeing more pattern, you know, yeah. more variation, yeah. that's, or uh, that's that's a very good uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I think it would be interesting to look at, at, at exactly that uh, successive process. I mean, when n not totally and utterly so, but typically so, I would expect that the further you get in advancing your draft. Uh, the more constrained you will be in how you develop your thoughts one step more. And ultimately you will arrive at some sort of stage where it's either irreversible or extremely costly to make major changes. And uh, uh, um, how this changes over the revision period, so to speak, is something you hopefully could get that through longitudinal case studies uh, with some, maybe with some <laughs> uh, experimental help too. Uh, it would be interesting to maybe identify critical phases in the revision process uh, and look more closely at what's happening there. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I'd like to, to get there. sort of curious, um, I mean, there's a sense in which revision is often expected, um, and then there's a sense in which people, I think, feel like, I don't really care whether you're going to tell me how to improve this, you know, it's mine, and this is it, I'm, you know, I, I've, I communicate what I want. So Jackson Pollock, you know, forget it. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but I think, um, Sometimes it's been important in the history of ideas to not revise, even though people feel that your ideas were wrong or bad or you, nobody could understand them. It didn't necessarily um, stop people from trying to put out ideas that maybe weren't taken up for 50 or 100 years. So I guess the question is maybe in all fields, do you think this is sort of part of the process that, you know, no matter whether you're a sculptor or a writer, um, there's a point, I mean, as you're doing a sculpture, presumably people could say, oh, you know, maybe you should take a little more out there. Or <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't you want to turn that face this way? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I imagine the sculptor might throw rocks at you, which would be dangerous <laughs> right. if you were yes. one of those, uh, standing yes. near the pie. But, um, but I think that, you know, the point is um, sort of at what point do um, people come to believe that 
they're no longer, um, you know, they're no longer willing to entertain um, any kind of impact input yeah. that, you know, they they want to stick with their ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and it seems like there's two parts to that. There's one, well, but you're not communicating, and the other, but well, you know, I don't care if I don't communicate to everybody. You know, what I've communicated is is what's important. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to how you're thinking about that, how you're putting mm -hmm. that into this um, framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's an Im important idea and uh, an, an extension to uh, to this point, I guess. But it also has to do with these different cultures of revision, as you can see around. Uh, if 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 uh, I mean the. The revisions going on in uh, everyday conversation uh, seem to have uh, dif different norms and, and uh, different organization than these long-term processes when you, when you produce a piece of art and put it in a gallery and so on. So but it also could be part of a termination process yes. as well. That, yes. you know, um, it's there for, you know, uh, it's an artifact now that I'd like to have stay that artifact, yeah. then it couldn't be, it wouldn't be revised, but there might be a new artifact. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, I don't know, I guess it's a, um, an interesting um, challenge. I'm also curious, and maybe other people have thoughts too, um, we talked about this earlier, but you know, where in the point in education do we start to get people interested in revision, or when do people in the process of education um, kind of get uh, instruction or guidance or thoughtfulness about the process of revision. I mean, we're working in classrooms a lot where people are supposed to revise, and at least 20% um, of our students rarely, if ever, revise. I mean, they really, no matter what is uh, what the stakes are, they're sort of like, eh. <laughs> They've already reached their process. They're at their, their stopping point, um, and they're not really willing to make a new, you know, view. So I guess I'm curious as to how in education we really get this idea across to people as to what the advantages are and why you would want to revise. And I think what you're saying is that you know when you become expert in a field, revision is pretty much a component um, of most fields. Um, and yet in our schools, we I don't think emphasize this nearly as much as it might possibly be appropriate. So I'm just curious, I mean, if you're teaching, have you been teaching revision processes? How does that work? If um, you're in the classroom, have you observed uh, uh, conditions under which revision has been uh, advocated, encouraged, or supported? Yeah. I feel like that's a very common component in those English classes, like revising your essays and having other people revise your essays and going through that. I don't know if you see it as much in other fields. Like I can't remember a science class, for example, where like somebody was like, have you revised your lab report? Um, I mean, you see it sometimes, obviously, like formal reports in particular. But I feel like revision is something that seems to be really closely tied to writing. Um, maybe because it's so easy to mispronounce, like mess up grammar and stuff like that. But I like, can't actually think of a case where I've seen it where it wasn't like a writing type situation. Mm. Um, and more mechanics than content. Yeah. I mean, both yeah. sometimes, yeah. but yeah, I feel like it's often associated very much with like, yeah, like like of English classes, like where I feel like I, I personally saw it the most growing up. The closest I've seen in early science class is like checking your work, which for physics always meant check your units. <laughs> you know, that was like something that like your teacher would just say to you every single time. It's like, did you check your units? Like that would be the last question. Let me just give a little comment to, to this discussion. I think it's very interesting, and I, I think uh, revision is typically maybe uh, defined or interpreted in a rather narrow sense. So revision is something you do towards the end of a discovery and knowledge crafting process. Uh, but uh, uh, in a wider sense, it, it's closely <laughs> related to 
several other concepts here, and I, I haven't written up all the concepts I could think of even. Uh, so in, in an early phase, you would maybe typically use a whiteboard and write up just a few words there, or a little formula, and you share it with your colleagues or peers, and you get ideas and you wipe it out, or rather you go home and you go back and you look at the whiteboard and say, no, 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 no. And it's very easy to wipe out. But that's, a, that's an early stage of the process. And this revision where you should, uh, like a slave, follow the uh, style sheet of the American Psychological Association, <laughs> that's very late in the process. Right. Too late to make big changes. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you very much, yep. and thank you for a great audience, and uh, we'll continue to talk about revision.